other trucker folks that we're going here on the Fallon Forum today, Monday. And I hope you had as fantastic a weekend as I did. Well, the weather certainly uh, cooperated. No complaints there. Uh, yeah, we had some storms, some flooding, but, you know, that's little stuff. Uh, uh, Sunday, a truly glorious day. And I was glad to be able to get out and not only hang two loads of laundry, but have some fun as well. Well, um, yeah, there's a lot of ground to cover today on on, on so many issues. Um, but this is kind of one of those shows that's wide open. If you've got something on your mind, if you've got something stuck in your craw, whether uh, whether it's a frog or um, or as they do in France, a, a cat. You know, that's right. The, the the equivalent phrase to frog in the throat in France is uh, cat in the throat, which is they, they just got they just got more capacity than we do there, I guess. But if you've got anything on your mind or in your throat, give me a call at uh, 515-244-0077. Toll free, because you can call from anywhere in the universe, 855-244-0077. In fact, I had somebody write me last week that they were listening to this program live from 4,600 miles away. Ain't this an amazing world we live in? They were listening from Switzerland. Pretty interesting. Anyway, 244-0077, or if you're calling from Switzerland, Yes, I'm jealous, and the number is 855-244-0077. My email address, fallonforum at gmail.com. And be warned, if you don't call, I may have to take a call from Frank from Des Moines. So again, if he gets on, it's not my fault, it's your fault. I want to take a second before I start talking about Google Glasses and um, all hail the CEO. Great column by Peter Fisher. I want to thank a few of our nonprofit supporters as well. The Iowa chapter of the Sierra Club, Iowa Physicians for Social Responsibility, also the Great March for Climate Action. And this uh, segment of our program is, is uh, brought to you by Gateway Marketing Cafe and uh, several of the uh, local businesses that help make this program possible. Tinker Heating and Cooling. Again, more of the cooling time of the year than the heating time of the year, but if you've got an air conditioning issue, give Tinker a shout at 371-2114. That's 371-2114. Hawk Restaurant, another one of my business supporters. Uh, a great restaurant located at East 5th and Walnut. 90% of the food they serve comes from Iowa Farms. Thank you, Hawk Restaurant, for doing your part to help keep, uh, keep Iowa farmers uh, moving forward. Also, the Immigrant Entrepreneur Summit. Thank you, uh, folks, for sponsoring this uh, segment of the show as well. That's uh, an event coming up in November. If you've got a business idea, a dream, a vision for something you can do to make a living, Go, go to the IES seminar. It's a great event, and a lot of people go there and come away with the, the uh, framework they need to kick off their dream. Okay, so um, so many clips. I don't even know where to start. We're going to start, though, with Peter Fisher, because I, I always, we've had Peter Fisher on the show many times and other folks with the Iowa Policy Project on the show several times. Why? Because um, God, they, they know their stuff. They do great research, and they also have a really, they're really, really effective at, at, uh, at talking about it. Uh, you know, some think tanks, they'll go out there, they'll study an issue, they'll produce a very good report. And it is so arcane. Yeah, I know that's a big word. It's so arcane that only the folks on the inside can really understand what's being said. The Iowa Policy Project is really good at making sure things are comprehended by the average person. And partly, I think, the, uh, the founder of that organization is, um, is David Osterberg, who served in the legislature a long time and knows that you've got to get your point across to people in everyday language, if it's going to be understood. Okay, so the issue that Peter talks about in today's paper, um, you know, you, you hear it said all the time. I mean, I, I heard this all the time at the State House. We've got to support our job creators. And job creator was a code word for big corporations. It, it never failed. That's what it meant. Um, even s the definition of small businesses were businesses with less than 50 employees. I, I think... Gosh, I think if the Fallon Forum could have 50 employees with, with Madison, with my, my assistant Madison Arrington rising to the role of executive director, would that not be awesome? Um, but no, you know, 50, 50 employees is a lot more than most small businesses ever dream of having. Um, but again, in, in Iowa and in a lot of parts of the country, uh, economic development means giving big stuff to big corporations. And again, one of the reasons used is, well, we need to create jobs. And again, no matter how many times we see that argument failing, you know, it used to be we want to support this business because they'll create jobs. And then when it became apparent that, that wasn't really working really well, we would talk more about the construction jobs used to build whatever it was they're building. You know, so um, 
you know, with the with the uh, with the Facebook facility here in Altoona, thirty one jobs. <laughs> I mean, that's that's not even a small business by the state's own definition. All right, so um, as Peter points out, this is um, this column is a little more lighthearted than a lot of the stuff that he and others at the Iowa Policy Project put out. I like it a lot. Maybe I like a little lightheartedness in my economic development analysis, but he talks about how um, companies like to flash the job creator ID card whenever anyone threatens to raise their taxes. Um, you know, uh, and, and this whole, this whole, this, this uh, job creator card is used to transfix governors and state legislators and for that matter, city officials, county officials, uh, local chambers of commerce, uh, you know, transfix them, um, you know, basically hypnotize them, um, who will then intone, as Peter says, quote, we will grant you any incentives you ask for. Oh, wonderful job creator. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it is, it is unfortunately true. Uh, you, you flash that job creation card and you are in when it comes to public handouts. Um, but he points out. He points out uh, that um, that the uh, you know the, um, the the goal again is maximizing profits, which requires minimizing costs, which actually means hiring less people. It means anytime you can fire people because you can mechanize, you do that. It's a good point, and uh, it's um it's part of the problem. So these um, these entities that these businesses that uh, that keep claiming job creation. I mean, look at Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo got away with this too. Um, and we'll, we'll see how far it goes. But they, ten years ago, they got a ten million dollar Iowa Values Fund grant to create two thousand jobs. Now that that's a lot better than the thirty one jobs that um, that Facebook is supposed to create for eighteen million. Nearly twice as much. They're getting nearly twice as much to create a fraction of the jobs, 31 versus 2,000. So on paper, the 2,000 jobs sounds good until you realize that a couple years ago, uh, Wells Fargo dumped about 1,000 workers in the same area of its business that they hired in order to get that $10 million grant back in 2003. So, um, yeah, there's that job creation problem. Again, they, they want to maximize projects. They're not Businesses are not about creating jobs, you know, I'm not about creating jobs. I've got two employees working on the Fallon form now. That's not my goal. I, I could fire Maddie's, sorry, derriere any minute now, and it would bother me not in the slightest bit. I would. I you wouldn't, wouldn't be even able look to back. Live. You just because my make shareholders. It. Oh wait, I don't. I don't have shareholders. They, you know. But the bottom line is, it's a business. You're trying to. You're trying to deliver a product, a service. You're trying to. You know. You're trying to. Um, well, not all of us are trying to make a lot of money. Uh, I would be in that category. I'm not trying to make a lot of money. I want to do good work, but um, that's you know you know you you have to, you have to uh, consider expenses, and uh, you know job creation is not like uh, it's not it's not like my my me, my my reason for existing. It's not why the Fallon Forum was established. We we're established to be the uh, fusion of politics and civility, not to be uh, not to be uh, uh, an employment service, right, Manny? <laughs> She's looking at me and wondering whether. Well, I'm going to give her a pink slip after the show. No, I'm not. <laughs> um, so, um, again, the point is, it's not just that. It's not just that businesses are are interested in saving and in making as much money in, as possible, and so they they would sooner fire you than hire you if they can if they could do better with that. But they're also um, they're also finding ways of shipping more jobs overseas, out of the country. Um, you know, and, and look at the recession. The recession, we're kind of getting out of it now, it looks like. And consumers during that recession, of course, stopped buying. You know, Peter points out that really the, um, it's, the uh, it's the consumers that, that, uh, that, uh, that, that really are the job creators. Because when people buy more of a product, uh, when more and more people listen to this program, for example, and it's easier to attract sponsors, um, yeah, then maybe I'll be creating some more jobs. You know, to, to manage all that. So, yeah, it's the consumers that ought to be defined as the job creators. And as consumers, maybe we should be focusing our resources on education, on a more diversified transportation system, on things that matter directly to people in terms of services, education, uh, health care, uh, recreation. Those things ought to be what we are focusing on, in my opinion, and I think in Peter's as well. So um, he points out that after this recession, you know, when the country started recovering, you'd think that, well, okay, you would, you know, the businesses would hire back the employees they had to let go during the hard times. 
But um, yeah, there's one CEO that he talks about who had to lay off half his work for, workforce. And when the economy recovered, he found he could make more profits without hiring them all back. By mechanizing some of the operations and by outsourcing others to low-wage wager, wa low wage workers in foreign countries. Um, and now, now, Peter goes into a kind of a, an imaginary, a, a stereotypical CEO here. The CEO fretted for a moment. Would they repossess his job creator card because he was actually destroying jobs? Well, not to worry. It turns out that you can destroy jobs right and left, and that has no effect on your status. In fact, you can ship 1,000 jobs overseas and then get praised for opening a new U.S. branch that employs 50. Not just praised, but rewarded with tax exemptions and credits and such. And these really help that profit maximizing thing that your board is so worried about. So, um, yeah, the job creators, you know, apparently, again, if you look at the recession, you maybe you cut them some slack then, but we're out of it. You know, they're not, they're not hiring back all the workers they laid off. Um, again, it's, um, <laughs> I, I don't, uh, I, I don't, I, I'd like to have Peter on this uh, program to talk a little bit more about, about what into his, um, thinking on this. I can't agree more. And, um, again, I commend him for, uh, taking the time to put that together. But, you know, it, the problem is it's not just Governor Branstad who wants to give away big truckloads of money to corporations like Oriscom and whatnot. But Democrats are part of the problem. Not all Democrats, but, you know, enough to see a majority of support for this approach to economic development in the Iowa House, in the Iowa Senate, shipping a heck of a lot of our tax monies to so-called job creators. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I, I wish they would pay a little more attention to the follow-through. Again, look at Wells Fargo. Take a look at Wells Fargo. Ten years later, after first Iowa Values Fund grant of $10 million, where are they at now? Well, um, I doubt they're anywhere near having – I mean, they can probably find a way to – you know, to, to smooth over the numbers. But if you look closely, I would be absolutely shocked if they have any, you know, if any way, shape or form can defend, uh, can, and, and defend any kind of numbers saying they actually achieved and retained 2000 jobs. Of course that contract ends this year, 2013. So if they find a way to say they have maintained 2000 jobs, they could let them all go next year and it won't affect their $10 million grant or the next grant they'll get or the next grant. Um, you know, this is um, a game that uh, we ought to be catching on to, folks. Uh, I mean, I, I don't, I can't, there's plenty of things to be upset about in, uh, in public policy these days, but gosh, this certainly is, is on the top of the list. It's a lot of money going to a few people at a time when they could be better spent or returned. And I'm, I'm, all, I'm, all, I'm okay with tax cuts. You know, some Democrats don't like to talk tax cuts. I'm happy to talk tax cuts. Let's talk over the people who right now are paying through the nose who aren't, aren't seeing their income grow, who are, who are struggling more and more because of you know, higher prices and, and stagnant wages. If you're going to give a tax cut to anybody, target that class. Okay, so one more item here before we go to a break. Um, Senator Lindsey Graham uh, calling, it, uh, calling a spade a spade. I mean, um, <laughs> he points out that Republicans are, are in, quote, a demographic death spiral. He says they will fail in their effort to win the presidency if the Republican Party continues to block immigration reform. Now, he said that this uh, yesterday, just yesterday, Sunday, um, in Washington, D.C. I wasn't quite sure what the event was. But he, um, he's one of the uh, handful of Senate Republicans who helped write this bipartisan immigration bill that's presently being considered in the U.S. Senate that Senator Grassley seems to be dead set against. Um, yeah, Grassley and other so-called conservatives are, are trying to block the measure. And uh, Graham feels it will doom his party next election year and in 2016. And um, he, even go, he, went, he went so far as to say a Democrat will remain in the White House after the 2016 election. That's, uh, that's gutsy for a Republican U.S. senator to say because we know how powerful the, um, the uh, anti-immigrant wing is. Of the, of the Republican Party can be. And, um, you know, the, 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 really the debate shouldn't be about pro-immigrant or anti-immigrant. It, it, um, it should be focused on, 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 on a broader conversation. First of all, looking at the conditions that exist in countries where people are fleeing to come here for work. You know, why, why, are, they, why are their conditions so bad? You know, we, again, I, I've been to uh, southern Mexico. 
is beautiful. Uh, I mean, the climate is something. I don't know why anybody would want to leave. I mean, I, I mean, I I love the drama of Iowa when weather. You know, give me a great thunderstorm, a prairie blizzard. It's all good. I love it. But if you're used to this calm, peaceful, um, warm climate without all that that drama, I, I, yeah, I, I suppose it'd be tough to leave that for what we've got up here. But um, so they're coming here for the weather. Uh, they're coming here out of desperation because if they don't, they and their families will starve. Uh, we have to start talking about the human side of this and why that needs to be addressed. All right. Um, so, yeah, Graham, thank you. I don't think I've ever said thank you and Lindsey Graham in the same sentence. So that's kind of a cool moment on the Fallon Forum history. All right, now we're going to take a short break here. When we come back, we're going to talk um, talk a little bit about GMO, GMOs, about Google Glasses. Google Glasses. No, oh, get a pair of those. Maybe, maybe not. I do want to thank the Gateway Market again for sponsoring this segment of our show and encourage folks to support this program's anchor sponsor, Gateway Market at 20th and Woodland. I also want to thank Tally's Restaurant, Bar, and Catering in Beaverdale. Diana's Wedding Cakes. Diana's Wedding Cakes is in Newton, but they also make wedding cakes for weddings in Des Moines, like Maddie and, Maddie and Nick's. Yeah, all right. And I also want to thank S&P Piano, who have moved my piano more times than their chiropractor can even count. I'll be back in a few minutes, folks, on the Fallon Forum. slowly steals a person's identity, tearing away pieces of their life little by little until one day it seems like the hope of a happy future is gone and there's no chance of getting it back. Here at St. Gregory Retreat Centers, we can assure you that there is hope. Our unique approach to recovery begins with the understanding that the dysfunction and damage caused by addiction can be overcome, not just dealt with. Don't let another day go by. Call St. Gregory today. Well, good morning. This is the 7th of June in the Lord's year 2010, and this is day uno one of webcast1live.com. We will begin with Max World Live with my special guest, Tom Coates. In just a minute, there's Tom. Wait. Howdy. And uh, we will be live for the very first time on webcast one live. this and say, gosh, remember that old day in history? Wonder where Walter Cronkite was. He must have been around hanging there too, but actually it's the beginning of Webcast One Live, and thank you for listening. Thanks, Rob Spearman and everybody who's put together this project together, and uh, we're ready to go live now. So thanks for listening to MaxWorldLive.com. I can't tell you that it's going real well from time to time, but it is going. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. That's Mr. Babers, neighbors, folks. Welcome back to the conversation here on the Fallon Forum. All right, um, a couple things before I, you know, y'all you, you make me do it. I'm going to go to the phone lines and take Frank from Des Moines call here shortly. Uh, if you want to join the conversation and preempt that that uh, that intimidating and threatening possibility, it's uh, 244-0077 or, or toll free. It's 855-244-0077. Okay, so um. GMOs, a uh, lot to talk about there. A tough question. I mean, tough issue because it is so complex and there's so much we don't know. But from Maine to Washington, a growing number of states are taking on that issue, the GMO issue themselves. Um, 
you know, it's just not the waiting for the federal government to take action on it just is not uh, not seem to be uh, going very, very far. In early May, in fact, in Vermont, Vermont became the first state in the nation, first state to pass a bill requiring the labeling of genetically modified food products. Okay, now follow just a few weeks after that, Connecticut did the same thing. Uh, that in, in Washington State, uh, there was a referendum on GMO labeling. Uh, uh, just announced that's scheduled for that vote is scheduled in November. Uh, last November, of course, there was a similar referendum in California, and that failed on a fairly close vote, 53 to 47 percent. There was a huge lobbying industry by the GMO, you know, interest groups. 45 million bucks, 45 million they spent defeating California's GMO labeling initiative. It, it shocks me that anybody would have trouble with labeling a product. I mean. Don't people have a right to know what's in something? Don't we have a right? Don't we? Don't we have a right to know? Uh, we, we know that we 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 uh, cigarettes are labeled as dangerous. Um, uh, trucks have a sign on the back: "Do not follow into work area." That's one I've never understood. I mean, there had to have been an incident years ago where some somebody followed a truck into a work area and died a horrible death, and so because of that, government stepped in and solved the problem by making sure that every truck everywhere had a don't follow into work area sign on it. I'd love to know the history of that. That's the best I can come up, come up with on short notice, just reconstructing a likely scenario. But, you know, we're, the bottom line is we're into labeling, except when it challenges the hegemony of big companies, in this case, big biotech companies. You know, so anyway, um, the states are tired of waiting for the FDA, tired of waiting for the federal government to do anything on this, tired, tired of waiting for the industry to take some accountability. And some states are moving in the right direction. Now, Iowa, as progressive as we may be on a lot of issues, I have a hard time seeing us move forward on this issue too fast for two reasons. One, we don't have that type of process here in Iowa where you can get something on the ballot as, a, as, a, as an initiative or a referendum. And two, we have, we're, we're, we're covered with GMO crops here. They're, they're growing like weeds, I say. There's so many of them. I mean, what, 90% of our soybean crop are GMO? Um, you know, there's a lot of interest here in seeing what we've established continue. So I have a feeling that, I mean, and I'm glad there are efforts at the state house here in Iowa to try to introduce labeling legislation. But I'm, I, I question whether they're going to go very far, very fast. That doesn't mean it shouldn't be done. Heck, I was the king of introducing legislation that didn't go very far, very fast. And a lot of it has since gone very far. But uh, so you, you got to start it somewhere. And I'm glad folks are doing that. And, and again, we can take inspiration from what's happening elsewhere in the country on this issue. All right, so um, Google Glasses. I mean, I don't know much about this, and I don't even know if I really want to. They kind of scare me. Um, I, I have a hard enough time with readers. Uh, but anyway, Google Glasses. I, I, Maddie, you're going to have to find us a great guest on this pro topic. I'm sure you can do it. Google Glasses. I mean, these right now, they cost 1500 bucks uh, for a set of these. And um, there's all sorts of issues. I mean, I don't, I, I don't, I can't even gra wrap my mind around what these things do. But apparently, they can also. Um, one thing they can do is take pictures. So, for example, you could have some guy looking at you with his uh, fancy sunglasses across the way, and you don't know it, but he's actually taking your picture. I, you know. So, um, interestingly, some in government. <laughs> this this seems very ironic to me. Some in government are concerned about privacy and security concerns and say that those must be addressed before these Google Glasses can be allowed to, you know, be sold, they, before they can gain the necessary government approval. Because, you know, apparently they can, they, they can actually snap or record a picture, among other things, using a voice command. So I can be sitting there with my cool glasses on and I can say something, who knows what it could be, and next thing you know, your picture. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's, it's mind boggling to me. What, what really, what really strikes me though, is that this is, this is possibly the same, the same U S government that is concerned about privacy issues here. Um, kept all sorts of secrets from us that we had to wait till a, a young, brave young man, Edward Snowden revealed, uh, recently. So, um, yeah, a little hypocrisy there. All right. Um, I warned you folks, we'd go to the phone and it would be Frank from Des Moines on the show with us. And it is indeed Elvis's love child, Frank Des Moines. Welcome to the show. Self. What? I said the man himself. Elvis is almost love child. Oh, Elvis is, Elvis is almost love child. Sure. Well, what do you want, Ed? I'll give you your pick. Gardening or... Uh, Gardening? Come on. That's, that's my favorite subject. Let's go. Well, okay. 
Okay, now, buddy, uh, I've got a mulch over here of ground-up car batteries, tires, tin cans, rocks, and uh, and uh, several other good well, things. What are you calling that mulch? Yeah, it sounds yeah, like yeah. trash to me. Now, listen, I'm, you're a gardener. Yeah, and you sound like a, you sound like a garbage collector. <laughs> You're a gardener. Now, I want to come over and take this stuff, like mulch, and uh, fertilize it into your garden and see uh, see what kind of stuff you grow. You think it's going to be, you think it'll be good for your uh, your gardening? Uh, no, and okay. I'd love to know where you're going with this. Cause... Okay, well, here's where I'm going with this. Uh, a business is a lot the same way as gardening. You have to cultivate an environment where businesses can flourish exactly now, you, that means you need a good regulatory framework well, so there would be fair believe, competition tell me tell me you actually believe that higher taxes higher business taxes higher wages more epa more regulation no no tell, I, tell I, me you actually believe ed fallon actually believes that that's going to create more jobs in this country first of all Fred, you have to work on your metaphors because the, that the connection of that to anything to do with your garbage pile is 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 is, a, is a, about as thin a thread as i could possibly identify the key is cultivation okay, so you have to cultivate an environment for stuff <laughs> okay. to grow all right but uh yeah I, I i do think that we should keep taxes as low as possible for everyone but it should be fair right now it's not and the problem is you get these big businesses that get lots of handouts why now how let me ask you you're a free marketeer how can you justify giving big handouts to Google, to to Facebook, to well, Oriscom, um, to Principal, for that matter? Apple supposedly has created 600,000 jobs in this country. I, I, I see the operative word there being supposedly. Well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just using facts that I that I see others put forward. So I don't. Wait, how can it, you use the word fact and supposedly in the well, same I sentence, don't, Frank? I don't put it forward as something that I'm saying with authority, but this is what I've heard. What I thought I've everything read. you said was with authority. Now, if, if they created 600,000 jobs in this country and thousands more around the world, I would be going to Apple and I would say, as a government, what can we do to help you to create more jobs? I wouldn't be doing things to cause them Frank, to create Frank, less they jobs. Don't, they don't create the, – a business is not – they don't exist to create jobs. They, they and exist to – a consumer to, doesn't create the jobs. I'm sorry. Pick your favorite restaurant. Let's say Tally's. Let's just say Tally's, for example. Tally's goes out. Somebody had to put some investment capital forward. Right. Somebody had to hire some cooks. They right. had to get an oven. They had to get a dishwasher before they put forth a product, right. and they and advertise that product to you to eat. And his goal, his goal wasn't job. His goal wasn't job creation. No, the whole thing of job creation is a myth. Jobs, jobs happen because commerce happens. True. Commerce happens because people get people have uh, have, have creativity. They have energy. Have, they have ideas. They have talents. They have skills. They make it happen because it's what they what they feel passionate about, um, okay, but or they feel passionate about making a lot of money. I, In that case, the, you got the, the the options for job creation are as, as limited as as they can possibly get. But until you have a product, until you have something that you're ready to sell the consumer, and the consumer doesn't always know. Listen, Ed, I'm going to tell you when the newest iPhone comes out, there's people that will sell their children for that. I mean, yeah, I think that's illegal, but well, you know, yes, give, but knock you, yourself but, out. <laughs> but what I'm trying to explain to you is people don't always know what they need till they see it and they think they need it. So yeah. uh, what that's, I'm that's, a, that's you, a sad count commentary on the uh, on, on our innate in our inability to um, disconnect reality from what we see uh, in the, uh, you're, the 30 you're second advertisement. You're following advertisements. the Bradshaw logic that everything is consumer driven and, and not supply side driven. And I'm saying that, that it's a little bit of both. You have to have the product out there. Oh, I, no, I, I, I don't disagree with that at all. But I, I think what we need to be moving toward eventually, and this is, this is probably going to be a different conversation, Frank, but we need to be moving toward a, an economic model that is not based on consumption and production, that it's, it's based on higher values, um, healthy living, a being happy, a sustainable okay, community so you where you think people need less to be happy, and you want to see this uh, uh, a product-driven, consumer-driven country go to uh, back to the Stone Ages. I know that. That's or maybe just back to the uh, early Christian church, for example. Oh, pfft. look at that! I brought a religion this time, and not you. Oh, my <laughs> well, bad, listen, friend. You should hang up on if, me. If you think I'm a broken record about abortion and gay marriage, I do. You are a broken record about climate and corporation. Well, that's because that's that's uh, yeah. <laughs> Frank, I got to run to a break. 
I got, right. I got some wonderful guests in the studio. You should get a computer, you big well, I'm luddite, headed, because listen, we got beautiful headed, people here in the studio I'm talking about theater. To the library. You what? I'm headed to the library, so I, 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 if I get there, get on enough, your bike and get down there so you can catch the next segment. I may tune in. All right. All right. Thanks, Frank. All right, bye. All right, folks. When we come back, we're going to talk about the Repertory Theater of Iowa's uh, summer performance, uh, Shakespeare on the Lawn. Uh, this is happening this week. Uh, I think Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We'll talk about that. We got uh, we got some of the people involved in the studio here with me. I do want to thank um, I do want to thank uh, Tally's Restaurant, Bar, and Catering for sponsoring this segment of the show. Frank, thanks for mentioning Tally's. Excellent segue. Yes, Tally's. It's a fantastic restaurant. And yeah, Robert Sanda is the brains and the brawn behind Tally's. He's been a great supporter of the show. Please uh, go thank him for supporting the Fallon Forum. And yes, Frank, that means you too. I also want to thank the uh, Fighting Burrito at 13th and Locust. And also on 117 Welch Ave in Ames, I want to thank the Story County Veterinary Clinic on Highway 30, Ritual Cafe, where I had a, a meeting this morning at 13th and Locust, and also uh, Sergeant's Garage. Sergeant's Garage is at 6th and College, just north of downtown. And don't forget Dan Kelly's real estate business. If you live in Newton, check out Dan Kelly. I'll be back in a minute. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Max Real Estate Concept Studios. This is Webcast One Live. your producer at least once a program, and it's really not worth having one. You might as well just do the show yourself. Yeah. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, this is, uh, we're, we're gonna, we got some more issues to cover later in the program here. Uh, but you know, I, I'm so proud of Des Moines for having become the uh, cultural and culinary crossroads of the continent. And I'm just waiting for the day when the chamber of commerce decides to adopt that name to describe what our city has become. Uh, it used to be that there was one, one coffee shop in Des Moines. There was uh, one playhouse. There was one restaurant in downtown Des Moines and we've got so much going on now. We can't even shake a stick at it. I do want to thank the Million Dollar Marathon for uh, sponsoring this segment of the show. That's coming up on June 21st, leaving the West Coast. 160 marathons relaying across the country to raise money for cancer. I also want to thank Max Wellman, whose music kicked off this segment. Max, uh, Max Wellman's trio, uh, a regular event around the Des Moines metro. Check them out. Again, Tally's Restaurant, thank you again for sponsoring the show. And thanks also to the Immigrant Entrepreneur Summit coming up on November 9th. All right, so I've got some people in the, in the studio with me. I've got Puck. I've got Helena. I've got Hermia. Actually, I've got people playing those parts in uh, Shakespeare on the Lawn. This is a Midsummer Night's Dream coming up, uh, oh gosh, this week, Thursday, mm -hmm. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Yes. It's and crunch time. Rain dates on Monday and Tuesday if it should rain. Oh, cool. So this is actually outside. This is it outside. Is. Yeah. All right. So how are the mosquitoes this time of year? Bad. <laughs> <laughs> but they will spray beforehand so there it's a, it's a mixed lovely bag, evening it? it's a lovely evening to come out and right. bring your blanket and pack a picnic basket 
and enjoy some live Shakespeare outside. Yeah. All right. And uh, yeah, this is um, a performance that we have seen before in Des Moines. I mean, I, I, I saw it a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, Puck, Puck is the, one of everybody's favorite characters. And I, I just tickled Pink that we have Puck in the studio with us. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Puck. You, you do look mischievous enough, mischievous feel, uh, enough to be Puck. Well, I mean, I'm, I was cast for a reason. Um, <laughs> it was typecast? No, I don't right. know. <laughs> um, I, it's a great character. I love playing him. Yeah, and this is uh, Cameron Reeves, folks. And, yes. And uh, this is uh, possibly not your first uh, venture to, into theater? Um, no, uh, I've, I'm actually pursuing a BFA in musical theater at Drake University. Mm. Um, and as is Natalie, who's playing Helena here. And... Um, uh, Carla Cash, who's the director, is one of our professors um, and uh, decided to cast us for the summer in this production with the Repertory Theater of Iowa, which is lovely to work with. Carrie, who's on the other side with the the other camera, she is a company <laughs> member of the Repertory Theater of Iowa. And um, getting to collaborate with them and with the other professionals of the community has been wonderful. So where are you, where are you from, Cameron? I'm originally from the Chicago area. I'm about an hour north of Chicago, so not quite a suburb, more near Wisconsin. Uh, almost a suburb of Milwaukee, then. <laughs> oh, Ken Kenosha. <laughs> Kenosha yeah. A suburb of Kenosha. Really near right Kenosha, right. yeah. And where are you from, Natalie? I'm from Minnesota. Okay. So. Welcome to the uh, sunny <laughs> south. So, uh, you, and you're both you're both theater ma theater majors. Mm -hmm. What are you going to mm -hmm. do when you graduate, Natalie? Um, audition until something <laughs> comes up. I'm going to audition until I get work somewhere. Okay. So we'll see All what right. happens. All right. Good. Good. And so uh, you've been you've been doing this a while, Carrie. You're, I have. You've been a, you're, I've been you're around an the block. old timer with RTI. <laughs> Right? Ouch. Yes, I am. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. A long timer with RTI. I am. No, okay. yes, I am. And um, I think that this Shakespeare production we do every summer with um, Salisbury House and Gardens is absolutely my favorite thing that we do. Um, I think it's really special that Des Moines has this. Mm. Um, we have made it a habit to collaborate with Drake and Iowa State. We have um, an Iowa State professor um, in the show, Brad Dell. We have um, Iowa State students in the show as well. Um, it's a learning experience for both the students and the and mm. Us old timers, <laughs> um, long timers, long, long timers. Long -timers I'm, yes, I'm, I'm amending um, myself there. Yes. And it's I really do think it's, this is a special thing Des Moines has. Um, like I said, you can bring a picnic basket and a blanket, um, or you can call ahead and um, occasions made right is pre-selling picnic baskets for the event as well. You can call ahead and reserve those. Oh, There's also good local business. Yes, yep. and there are chairs um, set up, so, um, oh, so you don't have to bring your own chair. You don't have to. You can if you want, but there will be uh, chairs set up as well. Um, the show opens at 7.30. We encourage people to get there early and get their spot and enjoy their meal. And you have wine and cheese and all exactly. those Exactly, and you can bring your well. own wine and yeah. cheese. Right. And it's Shakespeare's always a little bit easier to understand once you've had a little wine. So. <laughs> <laughs> We the, more, the more it. wine you have, the easier it gets, I suppose. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's easier for us if we have. Oh, oh no, no, I'm no, just no, kidding. No. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That, that would make a very interesting performance. All right. I'm joking. A sloshed puck. I, I, I'm lacking the visual on that. I would have a hard time doing some of those physical moves. I, 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 think, I think Puck by, by nature be sloshed, right? Uh, I, I'd say he's sloshed more on fairy dust than yes. anything else. So for, the, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the Luddites in my audience, Frank from Des Moines, for example, who probably I have never ever seen Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. Maybe even never even heard of Shakespeare. Yes. Uh, tell me. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. I don't think anybody <laughs> would go that far. Let me tell me a little bit about uh, a Midsummer Night's Dream. What is okay. what is the what is the uh, plot? Um, Midsummer Night's Dream is is sort of special and magical, as uh, Cameron mentioned. There's a, there's some fairy things going on. You've got the real world, um, the, the four lovers, uh, Helena and Hermia, and their two bows, and then um, they run off into the woods, and then there's some magic that happens um, at night when they're not paying attention with. Um, Puck and Oberon it's good magic and Titania. Or black magic or it's what? Um, lovely and funny, and um, <laughs> okay. I think it's one of his most popular shows. Mm -hmm. I think uh, very accessible to um, to Frank from Des Moines, who's never heard of Shakespeare. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's really it is. It's a lovely show. It's a lot of fun. Uh, very funny moments happening, yeah. and very physical, as Cam yeah. said too. Yeah. There's a lot of running around and. Okay. Um, especially at the Salisbury House and Gardens, where we have a huge playing space. There's a lot of outside running around. No, I see you're wearing a Taming of the Shrew shirt. <laughs> I am. And, and then, I, I don't. I don't I know don't, if there's a, a Shakespeare production with a more physical scene than the. Um, what, what would you call that? Not the a, fight scene. The fight scene. Between I, Kate I, and really, yeah. Is it a fight scene or, an, or a domestic abuse scene? It's pretty, uh, pretty horrible. <laughs> that's true. It's pretty horrible. But uh, you, nothing that physical in, in Midsummer Night. Oh, I would. Oh, oh yes, yes, there is. Oh, there's a sword yeah. fight. Oh, a sword there's, fight. Well, that's at least on equal terms. Uh, the four lovers fight. get into Lots a little bit of a ruckus yeah. once we <laughs> discover that the magic's been put on the wrong people. Natalie and I oh. fight. 
quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're getting along in my studio, and I'm pleased about that, at least. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That'll go okay. No, nothing, nothing happening yet. All right. So um, what's the cost of the production? Um, it, $25 for adults, $20 for if you are a member of Salisbury House and Gardens, uh, $5 for students. Okay. And um, you oh, can call students ahead. students get off cheap, $5? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think I'm going to try Everyone to become a student. It. There you go. Go back to school. Enroll. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I mean, don't you, people, people think, oh, 25 bucks, that's a lot. But think about what you get for 25 bucks. I mean, uh, yes. you know, and, and again, it's a great setting. The Salisbury House is a fantastic uh, backdrop. Mm. Um, and, and, and again, just, uh, and I, I like the fact that you've got a couple rain days because we need yes. that nowadays. Uh, so yes, many we do. options for rain in, in, in our, our, our state anymore. But the, um, but the uh, you know it's 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 a high quality production. RTI has been around for fifteen years, mm. maybe longer. Mm, no, know? what? <laughs> um, At least 10. maybe closer to ten. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But it's it's been a while, yes. and, and 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 everything you do is just wonderful. Well, thank you. So it's yeah. it's it's a, it's a it's a high quality performance and well worth the it investment. Is. So it is. And again, if, if we like if we like to see these things happening in Des Moines, whether it's a, a the, the great music, the theater we have, the great art. People have to be willing to invest in that. For, That's to right. Continue. That's right. And for twenty-five dollars, you're there for a very long time to enjoy the outdoors, the beautiful um, gardens at Salisbury House, um, enjoy our beautiful actors, and <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. and it's I'm, a I'm lot a of fun. I'm suspicious of this puck character myself. <laughs> oh, he's he's quite charming. You'll have to come <laughs> see. Him. Can I give you the phone number yes, to please. call? Yes. If you call Salisbury House and Gardens at five one five two seven four one seven 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 to reserve your tickets, or you can show up the day of the show and buy your ticket, um, I'd say at the door, but it's at the lawn, I guess. 277-177. Lots of sevens. 274-1777. Correct. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm planning to come. Excellent. So, oh, good. Yeah, yeah and uh, I hope Maddie does as well. Oh, she's using the thumbs, thumbs up. up. Okay. okay. Well, good for her. You can also reserve <laughs> tickets online by going to salisburyhouse.org. Um, and you can also pre-order baskets like that, like we mentioned earlier. There's also going to be chocolates from Stoms, and um, yeah, make a whole night out of it. Absolutely. Well, again, thank you so much for coming, and uh, and I want to thank Million Dollar Marathon for sponsoring this segment of our show. Maybe some of you are marathon runners. I don't know. Uh, well, maybe in the in show. In the show, we are. Maybe yeah. in the show. <laughs> right house, we might. Well, this is 160 marathons consecutively across the country. A relay run of marathons, passing the baton from one to the next. That sounds cool. Uh, close to about 4,000 miles. Leaving, they, well, they leave the same day that the, pro, the show starts. Well, they leave the 21st. Okay. You, you well, start so the they 19th. can see it on the 20th. Yeah. 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 The 20th. So they can come see the show and then <laughs> the run. run. It leaves from the West Coast. Oh, right. Uh -huh. um, all the way across Iowa, uh, coming across Iowa they in mid-July. Raising money for cancer research. Already they've generated 350000 bucks oh, wow. to help with cancer research. And more money will be coming in as the marathons continue. This That's is um, the uh, work of Above and Beyond Cancer. Uh, Dr. Richard Deming is instrumental in that uh, effort. And um, we've had a couple programs uh, talking about why this, uh, why this marathon is interesting and important. And again, it's, um, you know, it's one of those things that help make Iowa unique. Uh, again, how many times do you see a national cross-country event organized out of Des Moines, Iowa? Oh, wait, there's also that great March for Climate Action. So I guess it happens once in a while. But <laughs> apparently we're a good place to uh, organize these uh, cross-country checks from. I do want to also thank some of my other business supporters, Community CPA and Associates. That's uh, the, now the 10th largest uh, tax and accounting firm in Iowa, located on Ingersoll Ave in Des Moines. Uh, Fighting Burrito. Again, one of my favorite restaurants for lunch and occasionally for supper. Fighting Burrito is at 13th and Locust. They're open seven days a week here in Des Moines. Also in Ames on Welch Avenue. And don't forget my anchor sponsor, Gateway Marketing Cafe. Uh, again, not just a market for groceries, but a cafe for breakfast, lunch, supper, and a fantastic catering service as well. I'll be back in a minute. We've got a few more issues to cover before we uh, bail out today. I'll be back in just about two minutes. <laughs> From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. I'm Brian Leach, owner and general manager of Service Legends. Oh, I brought uh, along a couple of the uh, home comfort heroes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I am Nick Wondershot. I'm administrative manager. I'm the senior technician. I'm Service Legends. It seems like every good thing, when you feel it to the bone that it's good, there's a lot of hard work put behind it. You just, I, I don't think that you can fake it and have it turn out good. You know, if we seem like, okay, that's just weird, it's just a furnace, why would you believe so deeply in a furnace? It's not just that, you know, we want to show the world that you can have good service. Yeah, I mean, it's gotta be, it's your home. 
you know, it's, it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture, um, that we're going to do whatever it takes to have each client say they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do. And if we guarantee it's going to be a good experience for you, or else it's free, what type of work do you think we're going to do? <laughs> there is a guarantee. Temperature selection guarantee, fixed rider it's free guarantee, comfort guarantee, best value guarantee, all of these guarantees hold us accountable to ensuring that we exceed your expectations. And if for whatever reason we fail and we can't make it right, we guarantee all of those guarantees with a 100% money back guarantee. I mean, if you don't think that your technician can fix it right, are you going to say that to a client? No. <laughs> You don't have to worry about having a technician come to your house. We drug test, background check all of our team members. We put safe people in your home. Each and every one of our service techs, 400 hours a year in training. You tell it the minute they walk in the door. They know what they're doing, they've done their homework, and they actually truly care about what you want. Because at the end of the day, you're the person that makes sure I have a job. They're going to be listening. They're going to want to know what your challenges are. Then they're going to come and give you options, and, and you get to choose. If I'm there to help and I make it easy and painless, I did my job right that day. Well, when it comes to your comfort, safety, and your family. You know, you don't necessarily go buy the most expensive, but you get the most bang for your buck. Oh, it's worth it, because there's a lot of people that will find a way to get it to work right now, and then leave, and then come back, charge you again, and, and the cycle just repeats itself. So when I'm out there looking at the furnace, I want to find why it failed the day. How can we change the part today with something that you're not going to have to worry about? Is it worth changing the part today? I mean, you can put a lot of money into a furnace. I can fix parts all day. There's good job security in that for me. But is it the right thing for you? I get a lot of the phone calls of after the technicians are there. They're just in awe. They're like, wow, you guys are great. I mean, I don't even know what to say. You guys are great. Everything you did was perfect. It was great. <laughs> Keep going, though. I like this. <laughs> just give us a try. I'm going to take all the risk. I've got the time to make this right. I've got the support to make it right. Just check us out. And if you don't see the value in what we do. I mean, fixed rider, it's free or 100% money back. Enough said. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. That is Mary McAdams, folks, and we're back to our conversation here on the uh, Fallon Forum. I want to thank uh, the Immigrant Entrepreneur Summit for sponsoring this segment of our show. Uh, a great uh, march happened this uh, weekend um, on the issue of immigration. This was uh, attended by about 300 people supporting immigration reform. We talked a little bit about uh, Lindsey Graham's take on that and how important it is for the Republican Party to begin to uh, cooperate on some type of compromise on immigration reform. Um, the Immigrant Entrepreneur Summit, of course, is not focused on policy. It's focused on helping uh, new Iowans who have an idea uh, and again, if you even if you're you know not necessarily new to Iowa, you can still learn a lot from this event. Uh, uh, you know, if you've been working, if you've been if you're a student or you've been working a, a regular job, whatever that is, and you want to go off and start your own business, um, you know, there's a lot to learn, a lot of uh, a lot of detail, especially with all the changes in healthcare under the Affordable Care Act, um, and constantly there are changes in the tax code, and you know the the IES keeps up to speed on what those changes are, and uh, they're they're it's a great event to um you know to attend when you want if you want to learn how to make that happen. Um, okay, I also want to thank uh, Tinker Heating and Cooling for uh, sponsoring this segment of our show. Uh, Leonard Tinker uh, does AC work. I've been doing that for a long time. Give him a shout at 371-2114. I want to thank Hawk Restaurant um, again. Ninety percent of the food that Hawk serves is from Iowa farms and local producers. Story County Veterinary Clinic, my friend Kim Holding, who operates that clinic and has been doing that for about 30 years as well, on Highway 30 between Ames and Nevada. All right, so a couple of things I want to talk about here. Um, I want to talk about uh, government, um, government making a bunch of money off of students uh, because of the uh, student loan program. But first, uh, let's take one more look at the uh, surveillance issue. Um, again, Huge news last week. It's, it's, uh, I'm almost surprised it's faded so fast, but maybe I shouldn't be because the attention span of the American public, of the human species in general, let's be fair. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm the same way. I, you know, we all, we all, um, we, we like new things. That's why we like the news, new things, the news. All right. So, um, this may not be news anymore, but it's still extremely important. The, um, 
The uh, revelations uh, brought to light by Edward Snowden about the uh, spying that uh, our government has been doing on Americans and on people all across the world on inter internet phone use, uh, internet uh, internet use, and on uh, Verizon phone records. Um, Tom Harkin says, "I have deep concerns." He told reporters last week. He says, "This calls for some really in-depth hearings." I have no trouble with in-depth hearings. I just hope that something comes out of them. When you have hearings that uh, really are just people talking and nobody listening, uh, that's not much good. But I, I think uh, his heart's certainly in the right place, and hopefully that might happen. Harkin even suspects that some of these um, proceedings, that uh, some, of, some of what the NSA, the Natural, National Security Agency, is doing might actually violate the Patriot Act. And the Patriot Act, I mean, a lot of us were opposed to that because that becomes, that becomes more invasive it has some parameters, but it's more invasive than practices have been in this country. And so if what they're doing it violates that, that just tells you how far they've been willing to go. Um, Tom Latham doesn't say much, but he says, um, the unanswered question is whether the programs have overstepped the bounds of what was intended by Congress and whether we trust the government to wield this kind of cap capability to access such a vast amount of information on Americans without violating our rights. Okay. That is an unanswered question. As our U.S. congressman, we would like you to answer it. So, again, doesn't say much, but uh, at least he said something, I guess. Uh, David Loebsack, the uh, U.S. congressman from uh, southeastern Iowa, Democrat, um, thinks it's essential that effective actions be taken to keep the country safe, but those actions must and can be balanced with robust protections for Americans' privacy. That is why I am concerned about the breadth of this program. Okay. Again, uh, it doesn't, you know, I, I think Harkin so far is the only one for actually calling for some action. So good for him. Uh, Representative Bruce, Bruce Braley says um, he'll demand more information on these programs and push for answers to questions of whether we've gone too far. Good. Somebody else actually saying they're going to do something. Good. Thank you. And last uh, but not least, I was own Steve King. Steve King, um, of course, he was on Fox News when he made this statement. He uh, was on Sean Hannity, in fact. Um, uh, he said that um, each component of the surveillance efforts could probably probably be justified on its own. I'm not sure what that means. But he says maybe constitutionally, maybe statutorily, maybe justify it as far as an intrusion into privacy. I don't, I'm not even quite sure what to make of that. But he says when you put this whole picture together, it's more than creepy. It's beyond the imagination of George Orwell. You know, that's, um, that's a typical Steve King quote. I actually kind of agree with it this time. <laughs> I don't understand the first part, uh, the maybe. Uh, I, I don't see any maybe about it myself. Um, and especially if you do feel that it's creepy and beyond the imagination of even George Orwell, maybe that says that um, it really is uh, a problem. King, King concludes by saying, I'm really out of patience with this administration. And I've been lied to in a classified setting in the past, so if this is the case, it's not the first time. Okay, well, again, it was George Bush that started all this stuff. Um, I'm not saying Obama hasn't continued it and even expanded upon it, but if you don't like it, don't just blame this administration. Um, Harkin also, though, he Harkin also expressed distrust. He doesn't trust security officials' statements that all the surveillance is necessary because it was has thwarted terrorism. Well, that puts him a little bit out of sync with the uh, president. And again, I anytime anytime a a sitting U.S. congressman challenges a higher-ranking official in his or her own party, there's often something worth paying attention to there. Okay, um, one more thing to talk about today. Um, <laughs> I did not know this. I mean, I, I, I had my share of student loans. In fact, it took me till about age 40 to pay off my student loans. Uh, my kids have been uh, more fortunate and more prudent. Uh, they, they've been able, I know they've also got a lot of help from me. But uh, they've been able to get through college without having tremendous debt, which is good. But the average student, of course, is riddled with, uh, with, uh, with us college loan debt. So apparently, this just in, uh, this, um, apparently the U.S. Uh, government projects to make more money off student loans this fiscal year. $50 billion, in fact. $50 billion off of student loans. More money than ExxonMobil made, Apple, J.P. Morgan, Chase, or Fannie Mae, any, any, more, more money than any of those big corporations made on their respective businesses last year. And this is according to the uh, Congressional Budget Office. The, um, the federal government is projecting a, a record $50 billion in profit on student loans. I mean, I, 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 did, I did not realize this was happening. 
I mean, it's just, it's wrong on, on, on several levels. I mean, you know, maybe, 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 just maybe the cost of college tuition is too high. Just maybe I'm saying, well, when you look at the fact that it's gone up uh, exponentially over the last 30 years uh, compared to the cost of uh, compared to people's wages and the cost of other, other consumer goods, other services. Yeah. Maybe just maybe uh, <laughs> college is too expensive and student loans are becoming burdensome. But um you know, I can understand who, who says this is a quote from a, a student in Detroit, Christy Curry, Courier, who says, um, quote, I can understand private companies making profits off student loans. Part of mine are private, but it doesn't make sense for the government to make huge profits off the backs of young students just trying to make themselves employable in a terrible economy. Boom, I think she nails that one. So, I, you know, I don't know what to do about this. I don't know what will be done about it. Um, yeah, it's it's hard to know. Uh, it it just uh, I guess the bottom line for me, what I take away from this is this: the the uh, the um the cost of college has become prohibitive, and the assurance of a job after college is so um minimal. I mean, you really have no uh you you have no way of knowing for sure whether you're going to uh going to get a, land a job. Um, some professions better than others, but uh, yeah, it's just not what it used to be. It's not it's not the gateway to a high paying job anymore. And yet it certainly is the gateway to incredible debt and apparently the gateway to incredible profit for the federal government um, to the tune of more than all these other big corporations, uh, you know, make. <laughs> oh, boy, something uh, something has to happen there. Um, OK, one more thing to talk about here. This is just I got to mention this. Um, why? Why is that? Why is nine? What is it? Is it nine point five million? Why? Why is a big chunk of money? Uh, not being spent. Uh, I mean, you got we got these floods. Um, we got a whole chunk of money coming in from the federal government to uh, pay for them. You know, pay people whose homes are wrecked, and yet a big chunk of the money is not being spent. I do not understand that. Uh, you would think that again, 2008 was the flood that hit Cedar Rapids. It's been five years. You would think that um, that all the money would have been spent, and you would think it would have been spent wisely. Now. Um, I, I don't really know whether the, this is a legitimate criticism or not. Sometimes the uh, Des Moines Register goes on a witch hunt. I've seen that happen repeatedly. And sometimes it's just hard to know whether this is a witch hunt or a legitimate concern. The accusation is that Cedar Rapids approved millions more in buyout appraisals uh, based on private assessments. You know, so, you know, so, you know the, uh, the, uh, the official assessor comes in and says, okay, your property... Well, I guess it was based on your property being what it was worth before the flood plus 7%, which I, I guess by some logic makes sense. But uh, but a lot of these properties, and most of them, a lot of them seem to be commercial properties as well, which is interesting, which is a little troubling. Um, why would they, why would they, and again, I haven't looked at the entire research, but the ones that were profiled were all commercial. Um, you know, if you can go out and hire somebody, to give you an assessment that puts your property value much, much higher. I mean, in some cases, almost double to what it was assessed at otherwise. And, you know, if you pay that assessor uh, a decent uh, commission, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's hard to take that too seriously. It's, you know, I can understand why you would think, well, maybe there's a conflict there. Maybe that's not something we should, um, we should be totally confident with. So that's the criticism. Again, it, it is, it, it, the register may be onto something there, they might be missing. I mean, I know that Cedar Rapids Mayor Ron Corbett steadily, strongly defends the practice. Says, you know, there's nothing here, nothing here to see at all. But um, and again, the other side of the story is a big chunk of the money that Cedar Rapids got still has not been spent five years after the flood. We we may, we may talk more, more about this as more information comes to light. Okay, again, I want to thank the Immigrant Entrepreneur Summit for sponsoring this uh, this segment of the program and remind you to support all the businesses that help make the Fallon Forum possible. Uh, Dan Kelly's real estate business in Newton, also Ritual Cafe at 13th and Locust in downtown Des Moines, and up in Beaverdale, one of my favorite restaurants on the west side of Des Moines, Tally's Restaurant Bar and Catering. Tomorrow, um, we kick off a brand new segment here tomorrow on the Fallon Forum that I'm very excited about, very, very excited about. We're talking about education, and this is um, a new, a different beat on education. A different beat on education. We're, we're going to be looking at um, programs in the Des Moines Public Schools and other public school districts as well, but mostly we're, we're going to be looking at some of the different stuff happening. The Montessori program. 
Waldorf, homeschooling. Uh, we're going to talk about all the innovative stuff going on and why it's important and how it, how it may have positive influence on the public school system itself. Um, tomorrow joining me is uh, Sherry Hardina. She's a parent of a um, Coles, uh, uh, Coles, Ele- Coles Montessori School student. And also uh, Mary Jean Anikstad, who is one of the people who helped found that program and has been a teacher for a long time. So we'll start off our conversation about a different beat on education with uh, in- input from a parent and a teacher from Coles. Uh, we'll also tomorrow hear from, uh, hear from um, uh, Robert Neiman. Robert Neiman is with the, um, the Alamakee County Protectors. We're working on the sand fracking issue in northeast Iowa. <clears throat> and I'm glad the show is over, Maddie, because I am losing my voice. And I'm blaming you. All right. Thank you, folks. Thanks to Maddie Arrington, my producer. All teasing aside, she does a fantastic job. Thanks to Webcast One Live for providing the studio. I'll be back tomorrow. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. <laughs>